let's turn down the room lights a little bit. Um, I'm George Erbacher. I work down in interventional radiology. <coughs> and uh, Dr. Alexopoulos uh, offered to uh, introduce me, but I said, let me do it. I'm faster. Okay. So I, I did a family medicine. Actually, I did an internship in Cleveland, which is going to be important here in a second. Okay. And the hospital I used to work with is now part of the Cleveland Clinic. I did a family practice residency in Denver. And then I did family medicine in a local rural town in northwest Kansas. So I always get a giggle when people call me up and they say, I'm at a really little hospital that only has 50 beds. I said, yeah, mine had 19. The average census was one when I got there. It was 19 when I left. So, uh, and I've worked in the rural area a lot. I'm from, uh, you know, western Kansas. And actually, if you kind of stand at the Red River and look north, it all looks pretty much the same. So, uh, and I think we're talking about what middle America is about there, okay? So, after many years in family medicine, and when my last son was born, my wife said, uh, you ever going to see this kid awake? Because I was working way too many hours. And I hated radiology because I thought they looked at plane films and told you something, and I didn't think that was real. But I came here, and uh, Dean Fulham was pulling a, a slug out of somebody's pulmonary artery. They got shot in the belly, and that 45 floated out there, and he pulled in the groin. Rob Archer cut down on the groin and took it out. I said, I'm going to do that. So I came and did radiology here, and then did an interventional fellowship at the uh, University of Cincinnati. And then the group hired me, and I've been here ever since. So most of you know me, and that's kind of where we come from. So I tell people I'm just pretty much of a family practitioner that plays around downstairs, all right? So if you think of me that way, that's probably a good way to think of me. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. And actually, this talk started about 15 years ago. It's been through lots of variation. And I originally put it in there because I was kind of joking. You know, the fourth discipline of oncology, what are you talking about? Well, you know, we have medical oncology, we have surgical oncology, and we have radiation oncology, okay? Well, where do we fit into this picture? Well, let me share with that a little bit, right? All right, so what's the objectives of this? Be aware of the types of malignancies that are treatable with image guidance. Have a broad perspective of the indications for imaging guided therapies. Understand your role. We all have a role as a member of the oncologic patient healthcare team. And Steve Buck is one of my good friends. I bring my own family down here for him to take care of. And he's taught me a lot before that Richard stab. So we've had a, a, a bunch of wonderful oncologists here. And we used to have radiation oncology here. Um, and someday I'd like to see all that come back because in the treatment of an oncologic patient, it needs to be a total team approach. And everybody on that team uh, needs to contribute to how can we best help that patient, and that's called tumor board, okay? So and in and, and the absence of tumor board, we've got to work really hard, all right, to make sure that this person gets the best possible therapy possible, all right? And IRs are people that use imaging guidance to fix things, okay? So I'm going to go through a few brief things here about uh, IR. Uh, most procedures are outpatient. You come in in the morning, you go home at 3 o'clock. Generally speaking, general anesthesia is not necessary. Risk, pain, and recovery are often significantly reduced with this local anesthetic and needle and bye-bye. The procedures are usually less expensive than surgery or other alternatives, but not exclusionary. Okay, really important. Things we do, uh, angiography, angioplasty. And I do want to talk about this for a few seconds. Justin, st st step up for a second. Stand up. Justin is our new lead nurse in interventional radiology. Uh, he's spent time over at uh, St. John's in IR, and we're just really happy to have him. And he says, would you ask people to assess their patients when they come in for central venous access? Because we don't like staying at 8 o'clock at night doing TikTok, okay? So think about that ahead of time. Usually it's worse on Friday. Thank you, Justin. And, and we got a bunch of people from IR here. I want you to know them as their faces. We're here to help you, okay? Really, really important. So lots of junk we do there, um, and people don't think about some of these things, all right? And this is something that, you know, sometimes we don't think about, all right? Um, of course, you know about all these things. And here I'm going to put ablation. If you can see something and you can put something into it that creates energy, you can do something to kill it. We'll talk about that. Then, then grafts, we do lots of thrombolytic therapy. We do these things and some other kind of things for people with portal venous hypertension. We do lots of non-vascular stuff, and, you know, people, you know, ask us to do bronchial artery embos for people that are bleeding too much, like hemorrhaging out their mouth, okay, because they're coughing out of their lungs. 
Um, musculoskeletal IR, I've always had a real interest in this. Something new in this world is called 10X. It's a little ultrasound probe. You put it up against a tendon or uh, where a tendon attaches, and it puts in ultrasound energy, and it helps you heal your tendons and your tendon injury um, much faster and other ways to do things. Head and neck, uh, we do stuff like this, always in conjunction with vascular surgery. Um, this is something that Mercy is interested in us doing, and we did some in the mid-90s, okay? And so lots and lots of things we can do. Let's talk about the things we can do for malignancy. All cancers are fed by an artery, okay? If they're fed by an artery, that's an avenue for us to do something to it, all right? And that's kind of the basis of hepatic malignancy. So the two major tools we have in the world of interventional oncology are what we call artery-directed therapies and then what I'll call imaging-directed therapies. And, and just to kind of split that up as an example, in liver, if you've got two to three centimeter mets or liver cancer, and it doesn't matter if it's liver, spleen, wherever, lungs, two to three is kind of our little cutoff point. If you've got more than two to three, uh, two to three centimeter lesions, then we're headed into hepatic artery-directed therapies rather than ablative therapies. But kind of the thing that's happening nowadays is combined therapies, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I just came from my Society of Interventional Radiology meeting about three weeks ago, and we talked a lot about combining therapies, okay? So what are these catheter-directed therapies? Uh, there's something we call blands. We put in these little particles. Um, the most common one we use is tris axle gelatin microspheres. Think of little baby gelatin spheres that are accurately sized to block up right at the pre-arterial level of the tumor. Now, one of the things that tumors do, especially HCC and vascular tumors, is they make uh, what I call vascular endothelial growth factors, okay? VEGF is one of them. And when Dr. Buck talks about his kinase inhibitors, all right, that's one of the things they work on. When we talk about HCC, we're going to talk about the, the medication they have that's a VEGF blocker, okay? Because what those tumors do is when they make VEGF, that makes increased amount of blood supply grow to the tumor, all right? And tumoral blood supply is like blood supply that's also to abscesses and infection if it doesn't have smooth muscle and it's wall. So it has what we call real low resistance flow. Lots more flow goes to the tumor than to the rest of the organ around it, which becomes really important when we start dumping stuff into that artery because it's kind of like a heat sinking missile, all right? That stuff's going to go where the most amount of blood supply is, which is going to be really important when we start talking about uh, embolization. So um, the way I explain it to a patient is if you've got a tumor in your liver, what would happen if you put a rubber band on your finger and you made it tight enough, it turned turn black and fall off eventually? You've rendered ischemic, okay? That's the idea around the bland embolization is rendered ischemic. The next is chemoembolization, <clears throat> where we mix chemo, say like adriamycin or cisplatin or myomycin C or, you know, lots of different kind of chemo drugs uh, with those beads. And the idea there is you put in a few beads, you put in some chemo, you put in some beads, you put in some chemo, you do mixes of those things, and you achieve concentrations of the chemo agent in the tumor hundreds and hundreds of times greater than you would with systemic chemotherapy. And so that's what chemoembolization is about. And then there's another form of embolization that we do uh, that I call internal radiation. Okay, now most, most of the things that go to the liver are not sensitive to external beam radiation, right? Well, this is a way of delivering uh, internal radiation, and Y90 is a beta emitter. And what's that mean? Beta emitter is a real intense uh, radiation, but it only goes about two millimeters, all right? So unless you can put the source really close to the tumor, uh, you don't do so much good, all right? And um, the radiology group I'm part of, in fact, back in the mid-90s, I started going to when Cancer Treatment Center was in the city of Faith and doing Therospheres, um, which right now don't have an FDA official indication. But this one here is called Therospheres. This is a glass-loaded bead that has Y90 in it. This is the resin-loaded bead that has Y90 in it, and this has an FDA indication for colorectal cancer, and uh, actually Dr. Buck has asked us to do uh, some of this here, um, and I've submitted this to administration, and they're working on it, okay? But we'll talk about good news and bad news here in a little bit. 
Now, has there ever been any really good trials that compared this to this to this? Not really, okay. And there's a lot of arguments in the world about, you know, in the literature about the right ways to do things. Now, the Oriental, the, the Japanese in particular, because they have a lot of HCT, have bad experience with chemoembolization, all right? And a lot of the world's literature comes from the Asian world, okay, on chemoembolization. There's a lady at Memorial Sloan Kettering who I'm a fan of. She's done about 1,500 of these, and she says this works as good as this, all right? Why is that important? Because this is a little less toxic than this, all right? And the people that make the Y90 and sell it, they say theirs is the least toxic, all right? But as far as head-to-head -head trials in terms of uh, uh, survival, not a lot of stuff out there, all right? So uh, let's look at epidemiology. And colorectal is one of my favorites because lots and lots of people have colorectal. We'll talk about how maybe 40 to 60% of the people who have colorectal cancer um, are going to wind up with mess to their liver. And most of the time in these diseases, it's not the disease outside of the liver that kills the people. It's liver disease, okay? The liver becomes replaced with the tumor because the rest of the world oncology does a really good job about extrahepatic disease. Hepatoma, really common, um, you know, lots of hepatitis is out there. Um, and the next boy on the block is steatohepatitis. So uh, lots of alcoholic, that's coming. This is pretty rare, but any, it's a very vascular tumor. Uh, anything that's vascular we do really good on. Neuroendocrine, another one of those, all right. Chemoembolization, what do we do? Cut off the blood supply of the tumor. Tumor drug concentration, I've seen up to 100 times better. Markedly prolongs dwell time. It decreases systemic toxicity. Doesn't mean there isn't any, it just means it's decreased as opposed to standard IV chemotherapy regimen, all right. So what do we do, all right? Well, you got to find out where it is, okay? And just like we, we, and what I tell people, this is all a neoadjuvant. We all have to work together as an oncologic team. But you can see aggressive hydration, lots and lots of Zofran, see that stuff, right? And I was talking to Steve Buck oh, a couple weeks ago, and he said, George, in, in my young days, we used to measure vomit in liters. So when you had chemotherapy, you always had to come to the hospital because you're always dehydrated. What's changed all this? Why does everybody go to outpatient infusion centers? Drugs like that work really good, so you're not puking your guts up anymore, all right? So this talks about how we do this. We put little bitty tubes out into the tumor uh, bearing areas of the liver, and we cut in little particles. So you can see the vascularity, see this kind of wrapping around something right there. Uh, and when you're done, you don't see it anymore, and that's the way embolization works, all right? Now, the main thing we worry about with any embolization is non-target embolization. What's that mean? Stuff went where you weren't supposed to go. And a common place for that is the cystic artery, okay? So that's when here you see a tumor with those tumoral vessels, uh, you know, wrapping around the tumor. So one of the things we do when we do this, probably about 90% of our time is spent making sure we have safe catheter position before we do anything. Okay, and that's super, super important. The other reason it's super important is the, the, the variability of the anatomy in this world is off the wall, okay? What you're taught in medical school is maybe only 20% accurate, okay? Um, this shows a met in the liver. Now, the, especially the Asians, they use a thiodol. A thiodol is F poppy seed oil. Itself is a uh, uh, embolic agent, but it also stops x-rays, so you can kind of see it. And a lot of people like to use a thiodol. And if you look at all the Asian literature, they use a thiodol as part of their chemotherapy regimen. They think that this white spot caused by the thiodol is equivalent to the tumor being killed. That's being worked on, all right? So a, a fair number of practitioners use a thiodol. I never have. Um, I used it for lymph angiograms. We used it a week or two ago for something called a bird toe. And I forgot that this stuff is really toxic. And I wondered how come my three-way stopcock was melting in my hand. It was called the, the, the thiodol was doing that. So uh, anyhow, it's something you have to be careful with. Chemobilization post-treatment, just like you ever do everything else, is uh, you know clinical assessment. Tumor markers are the most sensitive things that we follow, and you repeat it about every three months. All right, so this is just kind of some facts there. Now we're going to talk a little bit about hepatoma, primary liver cancer, untreated median survival, and I kind of want you to. Keep some numbers in your brain here, okay? 
median survival. Okay, we'll talk about survival here in a minute. Okay, three to six months, not so hot. Okay, surgical resection. And mo for most cancers, surgery is the treatment of choice if you can do it, right? The real question is how many are surgical candidates? And at least here in Oklahoma, we find it really hard to find anybody who wants to do liver surgery, right? Anyhow, hepatoma, and it's only done for limited disease, right? So hepatoma, surgical resection, one year survival, 60%, you can have C. Put that in your brain as probably as good as we can do, okay? Radiotherapy, we talked about that, external beam, limited due to radiosensitivity of liver. In the old days, IV chemo, the stuff we had, really didn't work so hot, okay? It really didn't have impact on survival. And then Nexavar, remember we were gonna talk about Nexavar, I talked to you about that. One of the things that Nexavar does is it inhibits vascular endothelial growth factors. It inhibits that stuff that the tumor makes that makes increased blood vessels grow into it. And that's one, of, that's one of its mechanisms of action. And you know, the kinase inhibitors, there's a bunch of kinases out there, but it adds about two months to survival. Keep that in your brain, okay? So survival after chemo embolization, one year, 72%. Remember, surgery is 60% back there. Two years, 53%. Three years, 40%. So pretty good response rates, all right? And pretty good survival, all right? If you wait till it's over with, actually, we got a referral probably about six, eight weeks ago. Lady had been not in the OSU clinics, a different clinic system here in town. And this thing got to like 13 centimeters before they sent it to us, okay? A big HCC. You know, we emboed it. She's responding. But that, you know, tumors, you, you do better on little tumors than you do on giant tumors, okay? So try to catch them over early. Let's look about chemo embolization for colon mets, okay? So the incidence of uh, colon mets, colorectal disease to the liver, is about 20% at the time of diagnosis. So for all those people that have rectal or colon or whatever it is, <clears throat> that's why you scan them up, you know? You're wanting to see what's in the liver, all right? So remember, 20% at the time of diagnosis. So post recurrence after treatment of primary, 20 to 25%. So you put those together, now you see we're in that 40 to 45% range. So for, you know, one thing that should be triggered when you're doing an H&P on somebody that's had a colorectal cancer is ask the question, could they have Mets? And how did those Mets get there? The portal vein, okay? And why is that important, right? And I think we need, this is my idea, the physiology of the liver, okay? I think of the liver as a big hunk of sausage, okay? So when you make sausage, you take intestine and you stuff meat in it, okay? Now, if you want to make a liver, you have a, a liver capsule and you stuff stuff in it, okay? So the, what I'll call the meat, the texture, the tissue of the liver is just really soft stuff, all right? And so we have portal vein that feeds the liver, we got hepatic artery that feeds the liver, and then we have hepatic veins that drain the liver. Well, how did, how did that CRC get up there? Through the portal vein. How do you know that you don't have mets everywhere? Well, you probably do. I went to school at Kansas City, and I remember one of the internists got up and gave us a talk, and he said, all tumors are metastatic at the time of diagnosis. And we thought, this guy's nuts. But really what he was telling us is that there's seeding. It's cellular level seeding, and we don't have the tools. You know, I don't care if it's PET CT or whatever the heck it is. We don't have the ability to see on the cellular level, all right? The other thing that we don't know how to assess is the body's own immune system, all right? Right now, you and I are making cancer cells. How come we don't have cancer? Because we have a very effective immune system, all right? And why is that important, all right? Because there's big debates in my world if you're gonna do an embolization of the liver, do you do really selective to just to where the tumor is? Do you do the whole lobe? Do you do the whole segment? Now you can see where all this becomes kind of important, all right? And I don't think there's amazing answers out there yet, all right? But anyhow, if we look at survival for CRC, surgical resection, 25%, five years, systemic chemo, um, doing what we do, morphologic response, fancy doctor name for shrunk thumb. Okay, greater than 50% decreased DEA, 70 to 80%, median survival. So you're buying them 10 to 11 months. Now, the object in cancer is not to buy you time. The object in cancer is to buy you quality, okay? So those are things we have to talk about each time, the ECOG status, all right? If you're on your deathbed, you shouldn't be doing this stuff, all right? But if you're up, you're mobile, 
and you're able to participate in daily activities, you know, then we need to be pretty aggressive. And that's what the ECOG uh, uh, scale is all about. So chemoembolization summary. It's effective and well tolerated for palliation. We're not saying we're curing anything of hepatoma, hypervascular, and MEPS. There are many new modalities. Uh, one of the big things that's going on in the IR world is uh, what I call loading viral vectors that will go in and change the DNA of tumors. That's pretty exciting stuff. And that's actually going on, and there's some really interesting work. But just like everything else in medicine, it'll probably be 10, 15 years before we see that. And like everything else in medicine, whenever you do a study or you write a paper, what do you say? I got to study it more. We need some more double-blind randomized controlled trials, all right, whatever. So anyhow, now we'll talk about the other tools we use, which I call local hemocytic therapies. And these are all ways of trying to kill things with a needle, all right? And these put energy in of one sort. These are heat energy. That's cold energy. Um, and, you know, how do you decide? Uh, the tools for this probably cost $150,000. It uses some kind of a refrigerant. It's expensive to do, and it uses lots of probes. We have to be cost effective, all right? So at least at this institution, I'm not going to talk to them about this. Mayo's, other places have it. It has a few benefits, all right? We're going to spend our time in this world. There's the most amount of literature about this, and it's taken 20 years to develop it. This actually deposits more heat and has less charring and gives what we call bigger burn. For a surgeon, that would mean I have bigger margin, which is pretty important in cancer. Um, again, the Asians have done this for years and years and years. Uh, they put 22 gauge needles into tumors and inject stuff to kill them. The problem with putting liquids in there is where does it go? How do you control it? Okay, and that becomes an issue. All right. So we'll talk about the first guy on the block. And actually, if any of you ever used a bovi, <laughs> that's what this is about. Okay. So radiofrequency tissue ablation. All right. Oops, I can't get past you. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to talk about therapeutic radiofrequency, uh, how it's worked, how RF works, you know, places we can work on it, and kind of a little bit of a summary. What's the history of RF energy in medicine? Egyptians, so way back 3,000 years ago, treated uh, cautery, electrocautery, 1800s, bovies, electrosurgery introduced commercially. So it's been around a long time. Cut and coagulate tissue during surgery, all right? So what is radio frequency? What part of electromagnetic spectrum is this in? Okay, in that tech territory right there. All right. So how is it done? Just like a bovie. You have a grounding pad. There's a bovie. That's how the bovie works. Okay. And what's the difference? All right. Well, with the bovie, you know, we're concentrating the energy at the tip. Here we have a probe that we put in, and that's where the energy is deposited, and it creates heat around it. So how long has this been around? A while. Okay, mid 80s, late 80s, um, percutaneous alcohol, hepatic ablation, 90, radio frequency, um, again, renal cells, lungs, uh, osteoid, osteomas, uh, ablation, RFA is the application of high frequency electric currents to heat and coagulate part of tissue. Uh, this was actually in this institution in the mid 90s. In the mid 90s, we were doing about 20 of these a year, okay? So how does it work? Okay, once you get to 60 degrees centigrade, there's instantaneous cell death. Okay, and when we do these, these actually have a little um, uh, thermistor, a little temperature probe on the end. We try to get it up in the 80 to 90 range because you got to remember, if it's 80 to 90 here, that temperature curve is going to fall off as you get closer to the periphery of the tumor. So ablative techniques work really good on the center of tumors. Embolizations work really good on the outside of tumors. Hence, remember I talked to you about dual therapy, and we'll talk some more about that later. Okay, so that shows a typical burn. All right, and let's go back to that because right, that's kind of important. Um, this is the dead tissue. That's the necrotic tissue. And for those of you in the imaging world, if you image these two cirrus, see this hyperemic rim out here? You're going to say, I see diffuse enhancement around that. You're going to think that looks like active cancer. It isn't, okay? Which is why you wait six, eight, three months post treating these people before you image them. Because if you image them too soon, you're going to be faked out into thinking that's a residual tumor, and it really isn't, okay? Now, in the imaging world, the things we use to try to evaluate tumors are size, enhancement. If you're in the pet world, it's 
glycolytic activity, how much sugar does it take up, okay, how much glucose is it using. They're all in very imperfect, very imperfect, okay. The best way to know if you've got residual tumors is to put a needle in it, okay. RFA, lots of tools, lots, lots of organs we can mess with. The very first one we did here with RFA, I'll never forget, was a lady that they thought, she was only 22 years old, had gallbladder uh, disease. They took out her gallbladder and they basically seeded cancer out through her whole belly wall. And Davin Haraway was here at that time. And we became really good friends with this girl over about a three to four year time frame um, because we did so many RFAs on her. And the therapy that she got systemic wound up causing a myocarditis and she actually died from that rather than from her cancer. But it's, it was a very interesting uh, story. Patients always teach you a lot. So liver, kidney, bone, lung, and basically anywhere. And when these people go for their FDA indications, it says tumor. It doesn't say tumor lung. It doesn't say tumor leg. It says tumor, okay, which is important. So we'll talk about liver, and we talk about how colorectal is you know, a big deal in the United States. Only 10 to 30% is resexable. I'd like to see that number in Oklahoma. All right. And there's been lots and lots of publications about RFA. Uh, this is kind of an old slide because it's about the 03. There's been lots more about this. Um, and the big guys on the block right now are microwaves. Okay. Radiofrequency is an important alternative complementary tool in the treatment of metastatic disease of the liver and can lead to palliation as well as increased survival in selected patients. All right. Hepatic tumor RFA can be performed with low mortality and morbidity rates. All right. So now we try to do everything we can here with ultrasound. I'll talk about why that is. So this is a person now. How do you know you got colorectal meds? You don't until you biopsy it. Uh, this shows a probe being placed. This is being done in CT, which I hate to see. Okay. Um, and what the CT scan looks like. And what are you actually looking at? That's all edema because you cooked it. All right. And MR scans one week. Remember, we talked about that moment of enhancement. And you can see the zone of necrosis is really high. Now, why don't I like CT? Well, number one, it's a lot of radiation. Number two, you have to be parallel to the beam. There's not enough room to work in the pantry. Plus, you're radiating the patient and yourself unnecessarily. Uh, if you can do things with ultrasound, no radiation, it's real time, it's faster, it's safer. So if you can localize with ultrasound, it's, it's a much better way to go. And we'll talk about that some more later, okay? Hepatocellular, four million people in the U.S. have hepatitis C. Um, about 20,000 people uh, have 14,000 mortality rate. Um, our population is a relatively low risk procedure for treating focal liver tumors. Um, there's 41 centers, 0.3 mortality, 2.2% morbidity. Okay. Survival for unresected HCT treated with RF ablation. Remember, zero to six is what you do if you don't do anything. And here, we're up around 90% one year. We're up around 60% at three years. And the beauty of this is you go three, six months, something new pops up, you can go do it again, all right? So you can keep coming back, all right? And that, that's a, a useful thing. Hepatocellular cancers are usually soft, surrounded by cirrhotic liver, therefore allowing good retention heat. Now, if I put that in words that I understand, it's like putting a tumor in a styrofoam cup, okay? So when you put the heat in there, guess what? It concentrates it, all right? And so you get a lot better burns in a cirrhotic liver than you do in a non-cirrhotic liver because normal livers, remember we've got portal veins, we've got hepatic arteries that are very well perfused. All that blood flow carries away the heat. So we have to think about that a little bit. And the closer you are to blood vessel, the more energy you've got to put in to kill that tumor. Another thing you've got to think about in liver, there's bile ducts in there, okay? What happens if you cook a main bile duct? You're in trouble. Okay, so you got to think about that too, all right? As part, and there's ways to deal with that, all right? Uh, RFA is usually pre and post ablation. Uh, renal cells, we've done some renal cells here, not unusual. The problem with renal cells, especially in the elderly population, is a, a lot of older folks will get small renal cell carcinomas, two or three centimeters. They're going to die of their heart attack or their stroke long before that renal cell gets them, all right? So do they really need something? And that's a question that needs to be asked, okay, up front. 
So best candidates, four surgical candidates, elderly, those with predisposition to multiple renal cell carcinoma. What's a competitor here? Segmental renal uh, resection. But it's hard to find urologists who are willing to do that, okay? Um, so renal RF ablation, uh, it shows you these are not big trials, all right? And follow up, and it talks about local control. Uh, we've probably done about four, as far as I know, we're going to be in that category, okay? Because even in follow up, you'll not get bigger. How about pulmonary, all right? And, and I want to talk a little bit about that now, okay? 25% um, of the patients that are candidates for lung resection die. I want to share something with you. The federal government now says that CT screening for early stage lung cancer is, will be or is a uh, reimbursed modality. And it's taken, those, it's taken the government and, and medicine many years to figure out that the early diagnosis of lung cancer results in increased survival, okay? And I won't go into the whole history. That's a whole other talk if you want to invite me back, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. RT and chemotherapy together have a combined five-year survival rate of 5%. And it's actually a little better now with some formal XRP, protons, things like that. Uh, RF ablation can potentially provide direct cytal reduction, which can make RT and chemotherapy. And this is where, believe it or not, microwave shines, all right? Microwave, especially in the lung that's surrounded by air, has lots bigger burns than RF. So U.S. lung cancer. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer mortality in the U.S. among both men and women, and I think this is really important, surpassing totals from breast, colon, ovarian combined. It's the number one cancer, number one killing cancer, okay? The overall five-year survival rate for all stages combined is only 15%. But if you can get a stage one lesion and get it resected, you got an 85% survival. So why is that important? It's important to make the diagnosis early, okay? So I think the U.S. PTF, United States, what's that, United States, help me out. Uh, they put out guidelines, all right? Um, and the, the one that I most recently read, 30-pack year smoker, high risk of lung cancer, those are people that can qualify for, paid for, screening. Now, what's part of the problem with screening? Look at how many women get a mammogram, and then they see something goofy, and then there's a lot of stuff going on, they get a biopsy, and it's negative. So if the radiologists call something high probability, okay, for cancer, what percent of those actually turn out to be cancer? Three, maybe two out of two out of ten, maybe, maybe. And that's part of what the negative part of the early screening for lung cancer is about, overdiagnosis. But finally, they got it figured out, okay, and there's actually algorithms based on clinical risk and imaging appearance. And one thing that drives me nuts is I get sent CTs from other places said, look at this CT scan and tell me if you think this is cancer. They can't do that. I got to see Dean and Dean. I got to do the clinical, all right? You, you can't do it off of a CT scan. All right. So, uh, yes, you can cook things with RF. Microwave works better. All right. RF and bone, osteoid osteomas. We've done some of those. Uh, metastatic masses. Now, one of the things that's really beautiful about ablation, if you have a painful bone mess, I don't care where it is, and you ablate it, you kill the periosteum, the pain goes away. So for those people who have painful bony mess, we can help them, all right? And that's something really important to think about. Osteoid osteoma, benign painful bone tumor, RF is the current treatment of choice, off with the RF. Bone mess, really common, metastatic cancer is a common neoplasm. 40% of the new cancer cases will develop skeletal mess with abdominal pain. In the past, treatment for metastatic bone cancer included radiation resection and palliation, and, and we can still do combined things, all right? RF ablation of bone mess is pain relief. This is really important, helpful. This shows somebody in iliac crest. They got cooked. What we tend to do here is once we ablate it, I lace it with methyl methacrylate, the same thing we do kyphoplasties with. This is a bone cement that the ortho guys use to put in knees and hips. It helps stabilize it. Also, when you put the cement in there, it heats up to 90 degrees centigrade as it polymerizes. So it's a very effective treatment for bone mess. So summary, where it says RFA, and I put microwave in there, it preserves liver function, minimally invasive, potential for improved quality of life. Remember, I said that's what's most important. 
when combined with neoadjuvant therapy, which we've talked about, and it's repeatable for recurring disease. Right? So what are the limitations? High local recurrence rate. Now with microwave, it's less because you get bigger burns. But remember I said just because it recurs doesn't mean you can't go in and treat it because you can't. Limited lesion dimensions, we've talked a little bit about that now. Part of the problem in the literature is when we talk about a two centimeter lesion, the only RF probe available in Japan has a two centimeter antenna and they only did single lesion and they limited themselves to two centimeters. That's where that data comes from in the, in the literature. Why is that important? Because especially with the microwave antennas, they're getting four to six centimeter burn, all right? But it, it hasn't got into the literature. So our cut points are still in that two to three centimeter range, all right? And as far as deciding, is this an ablative procedure? Is this a, a, a embolization procedure? And like I said, a lot of folks, especially for tumors that are kind of borderline, maybe that two and a half, three, four centimeter range. What, what I like to do is put in the ablation probes, have my catheter in there for the embo. When the ablation probes are where they're supposed to be, do the embo, then turn on the ablation probes, okay? Because that way we effectively kill tumor on the outside and effectively kill tumor on the inside, all right? Uh, that just goes show some of the equipment for RF. I'm gonna go through that pretty fast. Um, the most expensive part of ablation is the probe, okay? So if you can get by with fewer probes that cook bigger with each probe, that's cost effective if you go for it, okay? And, and this talks about ablation size on RF. And we used to do a lot of these switching controllers. Now you can see minimum mean diameter 5.6 centimeters, maximum mean diameter 6.4. You want a minimum of a half a centimeter margin. And my approach to cancer is take a sledgehammer to an ant, okay? If it's a small cancer, kill it big, okay? And what, what, are they, what, what do the surgeons do? Wide surgical margins, okay? We're all thinking that way, okay? Anyhow, and low complications, and low complications, all right? So how do we do things, all right? Eval and treat. If you have somebody with liver mess or somebody you want us to see, fax 599-5068, eval and treat. If they're in the hospital, send us an order, eval and treat. Feed us some information, you know, what are their tumor markers, all right? We'll come up and evaluate the patient. We'll send you a big report. We'll do all this stuff, okay? You don't have to worry about any of these kind of things, all right? I get a lot of referrals from outside here, and I say, who's your oncologist? I don't have one. Well, you're gonna get one, okay? <laughs> so you can't do this, and, and I consider the medical oncologist as the conductor of the orchestra, and you know, we need these people as the team players, all right? Very important. Um, consultation with primary care, oncologist, surgeon. Remember, we've talked about who's in this, who's in this loop, really important. And consent, you know, we gotta tell the patient what's the truth, all right? And it's them that make the decision, right? But our job is to prevent, it, it, our job is to present, uh, these are the statistics that go with this type of tumor and if we do this and this and this, okay? Now, one of my favorite lines, and I always tell this to the patients, and they all giggle, and that's how come we do this. I tell people there's lies, there's damn lies, and there's statistics. And what do we do in medicine? We do lots of statistics. And I've just talked to you about statistics. Hand embolization, chemoembolization, Wine 90, RF, microwave. It's all over the field. It really is, okay? And lots and lots of practitioners doing lots of, so how do we really share that with the patient, okay? And I think the important thing is, here's what this says, here's what this says, Here's you, here's your state of functioning, here's what we think we can do to help you, is there anything I can do to help you? And actually we have little brochures, we send them to good sites, you know, National Institute of Health, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo, Sloan Kettering, um, all the big cancer centers. They all have websites that talk about this stuff. Go educate yourself as much as possible. Cancer treatment, follow-up care, depending upon where we're working, it tells us what's going on. Time, Band-Aids, antibiotics, how do we do it, PPO count. Now one of the really neat things that's happened in the world of imaging is the ability to take a CT scan or an MRI and embed that into an ultrasound machine or downstairs are um, in our room one and they put what's called like fiducials on people and, it, and you just identify certain points, say like anterior superior iliac spine. So what happens 
is we are able to superimpose a CT or MR image uh, on our screen and then use ultrasound or fluoroscopy to get to where we want to get to without ever seeing the tumor under CT or MR, okay, which is a big deal, all right, um, in, in order to be able to take care of people. So, next, whoops. Treatment consideration, number of lesions, we talked about that, size of the lesions, what are they next to, access to targets, extent of involvement, tumor staging, and you only sedate the people once, all right? Role of RF, where does it fit in with everything else? It fits in as far as the adjuvant therapy, and we talked about all those kind of things. I'm gonna do this very quick because I think everybody did this one, all right, to get to the end, all right? So I think this is really important, and it doesn't matter what's out here, whether that's RFA, chemoma, it's, it's a multidisciplinary effort, okay? All healthcare team members include primary care, oncologists, interventional radiologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists, anybody that has to do with the patient has to be part of this team, okay, and with RF work. So what are some of the new technologies? And I put this together a few years ago originally. Combine DSA with MRCT suite for catheter-based treatment. The software I just talked about, uh, takes that away. That software costs forty thousand dollars, and MR is probably about a million and a half. CT is probably a million, a million and a half, somewhere in there. So you don't have to do that anymore, okay? If you pay forty thousand dollars for some software, okay? Large bore CT with CT for fusion. There's actually one of these here in town that I've worked with. MR with this stuff, okay? Volumetric tumor measurement. The way we've classically looked at tumor response is size reduction, and guess what? It's probably not a very good way to do that, okay? Overlay merge 3D data sets from CT on ultrasounds. I just talked about that. Tumor specific imaging agents, and this is coming. It's really exciting. So we really have a smart bullet. Say like, what if we hook Y90 onto an antibody targeted to an antigen that's just on that tumor cell that's going on, okay? Um, new uh, chemotherapy, we talked about gene, loaded embos. Uh, we talked about yttrium 90 uh, as primary treatment for HPC colorectal with radio sensitizers, catheterectal therapy for other tumors. If it's got an artery, we can fix it. Portal vein embolization to hypertrophize the liver. Adjuvant with gland embolization. Greater application to other tumors, long bone, kidney, and adrenal. Use with enhancing agents. Uh, use of methods with each new heat sink. We've done that, okay. Thank you. Questions? That's it? All right, I think there's a lot of feedback. Have a great day. Uh -huh.